This episode was suggested by two listeners, Jessica and Ross, on Facebook. If you'd like to suggest a topic, you can do so on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast, on Twitter at Morbid Podcast, and on our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. Interest in these disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped hundreds of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. These days, it seems as if some kind of ingredient is always on trend. Currently, activated charcoal is all the rage and can be found in beauty products, health supplements, and even in food. It's said to detoxify everything it touches, despite the fact that nothing can detoxify the human body except the human body itself, with the liver and kidneys. Even though activated charcoal doesn't actually do what it's currently on trend for, it does no harm if it's put on the skin or ingested. Common charcoal, on the other hand, is carcinogenic, meaning it has been shown to cause cancer. There was another ingredient on trend in the early 1900s, which was added to far more products than activated charcoal has been added to today. This ingredient was added to everything from toothpaste, beauty creams, and lotions, to corsets, watches, and water. However, it was more like common charcoal than activated charcoal. In fact, it was downright deadly. But despite this knowledge, it was used in almost everything. This substance was radium, and it caused the death of many people who used it. Radium is a metal found in nature. Its anatomic number on the periodic table is 88, and its symbol is Ra. Radium and all its isotopes, or variations, are radioactive, meaning they emit energy, or radiation, as they decay. Radium decays, or loses particles, because the nucleus of the radium atom is unstable, and it loses these particles as time passes. The rate at which it loses half of its original particles is called its half-life, and this is used to measure its rate of decay. The most stable isotope of radium is radium-226, which has a half-life of 1600 years and decays into radon gas, another radioactive substance. As it decays, the energy released by radium can excite other chemicals and cause them to glow with a greenish-white light. In nature, radium is found in uranium and thorium ore. It is an element that is not required by the human body or any living organism. In fact, when radium comes into contact with living things, it has a detrimental effect on health due to its radioactivity. Today, radium is used only in nuclear medicine, helping to determine cell function. It basically functions as x-rays do, but from the inside out and is used as a tracer in body scans, such as positron emission tomography, or PET scanning, which is used to locate areas of the body that are cancerous. Radium was discovered in 1898 by Marie and Pierre Curie as radium chloride, meaning it was in the form of a salt. They isolated it to its pure metallic state in 1910. Radioactivity was new to science at this point in time, Its dangers were not well known or understood. Radium was just a fascinatingly rare, glowing substance that was warm to the touch, not a cause for alarm. Soon after its discovery, it was found that radium was actually quite dangerous to human cells. If a test tube of radium was left in a pocket or in direct contact with skin for several hours, lesions would appear long after it was removed. Marie Curie demonstrated this not long after she isolated radium, 
causing a large lesion to appear on her skin after holding radium to it for some hours. What was not discovered until much later was the long-term effects of just being around radium. Because it's radioactive, radium emits energy in the form of gamma rays. These rays can cause genetic mutations, cell damage, and cancer. If ingested, radium is treated by the human body similar to calcium and is deposited in the skeleton after circulating in the bloodstream. This causes bone cancer and tumors long after exposure has ceased. Due to its more obvious destructive nature against tissues, in the early 1900s, radium was tried as a treatment for cancer. Dr. Howard Kelly, one of the fathers of gynecology, was known to use excessive amounts of radium to treat his patients. Private physicians all across the United States started using it to treat many other illnesses, such as schizophrenia, hypertension, and generalized pain. They didn't know what it was or how to treat these conditions, so they tried it for everything. If you want to learn more about the medical history of radium, the podcast Sawbones did an episode about it that was really informative as well as entertaining. Because scientists and researchers noticed the destructive nature of radium, it was soon decided that the ill effects outweighed its usefulness as a medical treatment. Outside of academic and scientific circles, however, it was still lauded as a wonder substance when it came to health. An entire industry of patent medicines came out, all containing radium, this rare, new, and fascinating substance. Patent medicines are commercially available products that are heavily advertised as medicines and usually contain exotic or on-trend ingredients. They are usually advertised as cure-alls, but are actually untested and are generally created with the express purpose of making money off desperate and gullible people. Today, this type of product is increasingly restricted by government regulation in order to prevent fraud, unintentional poisoning, and deceptive advertising. During the early 1900s, however, these products weren't subject to these same restrictions and could contain, or pretend to contain, radium and also advertise it as a miracle cure without having to test or prove such a statement. As you may have guessed, these were incredibly dangerous products but I'll get to these so-called medicines later. The luminous quality of radium is what soon sparked its use in things like clocks and the dials of airplanes. If these dials were illuminated, pilots could fly much more easily at night, which was a huge advantage at a time when the world was at war. World War I began in 1914 in Europe, and the United States joined the Allies in 1917 after several U.S. ships were sunk by German submarines, including the passenger ship Lusitania, which we already talked about in a previous episode. William J. Hammer was one of the first to combine radium salts with glue and zinc sulfide to create a luminous paint. The zinc sulfide made the radium continuously give off its signature glow. Hammer called the paint undark. Sabine A. von Sokoki expanded the use of this paint to watches and clocks in addition to instrument dials. The first company to begin manufacturing large amounts of Undark was United States Radium Corporation in 1917, headed by von Sokoki and Dr. George S. Willis. They were an independent company that was contracted by the U.S. military to produce luminous instrument dials for the war effort. Soon enough, U.S. radium controlled the entire output of radium in the United States, specifically radium-228, then called mesothorium. As I mentioned, by this point, some of the dangers of radium were known in academic and scientific circles. However, U.S. radium assured their customers that the paint on each dial contained so little radium, around one microgram, that it was, and I quote, absolutely harmless. It's true the dials did little harm to those who worked with and around them. As for the people extracting radium and preparing it to be made into paint, precautions in the form of gloves, masks, and lead-lined aprons were used by the chemists and paint production crews at U.S. Radium to avoid direct exposure. The miners who worked in the radium mines of Colorado and Utah also had some of these protections. 
However, there was one group of employees that seemed to have been forgotten. Hundreds of women were employed by U.S. Radium at their factory in Orange, New Jersey. Their ages ranged between 18 and 30 years old. Few companies at the time employed women, so it seemed like a great opportunity for them. The pay was also substantially higher than anywhere else. At this factory, row upon row of women painted undark onto the minute numbers, letters, and other markings of instrument dials with fine-tipped paintbrushes. They wore no gloves, no lead aprons, and no masks. The women mixed the paint as they went, adding radium dust and stirring it until the paint became the right consistency for painting. The air in the workroom was filled with particles of radium dust. As they painted the dials, the fine paintbrushes lost their points, and the women were advised to reform that lost point by shaping the brush with their own lips. They were effectively ingesting radium all day, five days a week. When some of the women asked if this process was safe, they were told it was. Before I tell you more about these dial painters and their employer's negligence in protecting them from radium, let's pause for a word from our sponsors. Our regular sponsor is Audible.com. If you're too busy to sit down and read, but have time to listen, Audible.com can provide you with interesting and engaging audiobooks. In fact, there are over 180,000 of them to choose from, which you can listen to on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or other MP3 players. MCP listeners can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial of Audible.com by going to www.audibletrial.com MCP. You can also find this link on our Facebook page and website. If you sign up for the free trial, you get a free audiobook that is yours to keep, even if you cancel the service, and the MCP gets the funding it needs to keep bringing morbid history to your ears. Our other sponsor is ThinkGeek, the premier retailer for the global geek community. Express your love of Star Wars, Harry Potter, and Doctor Who, as well as the universe, math, reading, and so much more, with clever t-shirts and other unique apparel, home and office decor, electronics, collectibles, and more. Think Geek has great gifts whether you're into science or science fiction, and many of the items on their website you won't find anywhere else. Just follow our link, bit.ly slash morbidgeek, to search their massive collection. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash morbidgeek to get your geek on. Lastly, if you like this podcast, why not sponsor the MCP yourself by becoming a patron on Patreon? There are several tiers of patronage, the lowest being $1 an episode. With that dollar, you become eligible for several rewards, such as access to our patron-only feed and being entered into a monthly raffle. It takes a lot of time to research, write, record, and edit the show, all while keeping it free for you, the listener. When you become a patron, it helps us pay for research materials and keeps the lights on. If more people donate, we may even be able to eliminate the need for sponsors. That means no break in the middle of the show. If you'd like to become a patron, head over to patreon.com slash morbidcuriositypodcast. You'll have our eternal gratitude. And now, back to the podcast. The most well-known incident of radium exposure and subsequent injury comes from Orange, New Jersey, between 1914 and 1926. As I said before, the U.S. Radium Corporation opened a new factory and hired hundreds of women to paint instrument dials with undark paint. The company knew the risks of working with radium, as proven by the protective equipment the production unit was given. This knowledge of the danger is further shown by the literature the company distributed to the community of Orange on the ill effects of radium. However, inside the factory, every surface was luminescent, coated in the radium dust used to make the paint. The women who worked there wore no protection, and sometimes played with the paint, doing their nails with it and coating their teeth. The women were paid by the dial, and therefore, many worked long hours painting as many dials as they could, all the while pointing their brushes with their mouths every third stroke or so. 
A story about this workroom is related by Kate Moore in her book, Radium Girls, in which the owner of the company, Von Sokoki, was walking past the workroom and noted one of the girls lip-pointing her paintbrush. He immediately told her not to do that. Worried, the woman approached her supervisor and asked if there was some danger in pointing her brush with her lips. The supervisor told her there wasn't, and so she went on lip-pointing. Even when the company tried to instigate the use of glass rods with pointed tips instead of paintbrushes, the women were advised to go back to lip-pointing because it was faster and it earned the company and the women more money. They didn't know they were in danger. In fact, most of the women felt incredibly lucky to be working at the factory. They were helping the war effort by painting these dials, and they got to work with radium, that seemingly magical substance. As I mentioned earlier, at the time the factory was operating, radium was seen as a wonder substance, and people were trying to find a way to include it in a multitude of products, hoping both that it would cure many ailments as well as make them a lot of money. There were radium toothpastes, radium hair creams, radium-lined corsets, radium was added to water for drinking and bathing in. There was even radium-infused dishware, which you could use at home to infuse any liquid with radium. Thankfully, with radium being such a rare substance, many of these creams, salves, and other quackery didn't actually have radium in them. However, a specific radium water, brand named Radithor, did. This beverage, manufactured between 1918 and 1928, contained triple distilled water and a minimum of one microcurie of two different isotopes of radium, radium-228 and radium-226. It was created by William J. A. Bailey, a Harvard dropout, who advertised himself as a doctor. It was produced by Bailey Radium Laboratories, Incorporated, which was also located near Orange, New Jersey. Radithor, like many of these products, was advertised as a cure-all, treating everything from impotence to muscle pain. A physiotherapist prescribed this water to his patient, a wealthy socialite and sportsman named Eben Byers. Byers began drinking it enthusiastically and recommended it to all his friends. He even fed it to his horses on occasion. Over his lifetime, Byers drank over 1,400 bottles of Radithor. He died in 1932 from radium poisoning. He was buried in a lead-lined coffin, as his corpse was highly radioactive. It was exhumed in 1965 for study and was still found to be very radioactive. William Bailey himself died of bladder cancer likely caused by his own product. The women of Orange, New Jersey, suffered far worse than most people from their contact with radium. Years after many of the women had left U.S. radium, several of them began to have health issues that at the time seemed inexplicable. They were pale, their skin bruised easily, and red or purplish spots appeared on their bodies. These are symptoms of what we now know to be aplastic anemia, a disease in which the bone marrow is damaged, causing a deficiency of all three types of blood cells, red, white, and platelets. This was caused by the radium being absorbed like calcium into their bones. Many of them also developed what would later be called radium jaw, or the necrosis of the jaws, bleeding gums, tooth loss, and bone tumors. This condition was first reported by a dentist, Dr. Theodore Bloom, in 1924. Later that year, Dr. H. S. Martland determined that this condition was symptomatic of radium paint ingestion, which was due to the women repeatedly shaping their brushes with their mouths. U.S. Radium denied any responsibility, claiming the dial painter's complaints were a publicity stunt and paying off doctors left and right to say that the employees of U.S. Radium were in good health to anyone that asked. They claimed that many of the workers had pre-existing conditions and were trying to weasel money away from the company with their lies. One of the women suffering from radium poisoning, Grace Fryer, wanted to challenge U.S. Radium for the right to sue them for occupational diseases she and the other women had contracted due to the company's negligence. 
At the time, New Jersey's Occupational Injuries Law had a two-year statute of limitations, or a time limit on when a worker could sue after diagnosis of ill health. The effects of radium did not occur until after that two-year limit had passed, and Fryer wanted the right to sue for long-term damages. Four other women who were dying of radium poisoning joined her cause, Edna Hussman, Catherine Schaub, and sisters Quinta McDonald and Albina Larris. They sought damages of $250,000 each, which in today's currency is the equivalent of $3 million for the company's negligence toward their health. The newspapers nicknamed them the Radium Girls. At first, Fryer was unable to find a lawyer who was willing to take on the gigantic and powerful company. It didn't help that U.S. Radium hired doctors and other experts to review their workshops and report that they were safe working environments. They also started a smear campaign against the women, stating that they were dying of syphilis, not radiation poisoning. U.S. Radium also prohibited the publishing of a report from Dr. Cecil Drinker, who had been sent by the New Jersey Department of Labor to evaluate the working conditions in the factory. Drinker's report was grave indeed, stating that the workforce was heavily contaminated with radiation and that everyone in it had unusual blood conditions. The original report was swept under the carpet, and another one, extensively doctored by U.S. Radium, was sent to the Department of Labor, stating that every worker was in good health. Drinker, determined to be heard, published his original report in a scientific journal in 1925. Two years after Drinker published his report, Fryer found a lawyer, Raymond Barry, to represent them. However, the courts moved very slowly, and by the time the women made their first appearance in court in 1928, two of them were completely bedridden, and none of them had the strength to raise their arms to take the oath. The very visible illness of these women caused a media sensation and an outpouring of support. U.S. Radium, however, continued to claim it was not responsible. There are reports upon reports of how U.S. Radium tried to dodge these allegations, and the more I read, the more infuriated I became. The public at the time felt much the same, with newspapers claiming the company was cruel and despicable. Still, the company denied any responsibility. In the midst of this legal battle, Dentist Josef Neff examined the jaw of Amelia Maggia, a dial painter who had died. In the last few months of her life, the bones of Maggia's jaw were so decayed that Dr. Neff had removed them. Maggia's official cause of death had been reported as syphilis, but Neff suspected that it was radium poisoning. He took an x-ray of her jaw, and the patterns on the film indicated that the bone was highly radioactive. The bone of her jaw also resembled Swiss cheese, being full of holes where the radium had caused it to necrotize or die. As the court case dragged on and on, the women's health continued to deteriorate. They were now all too ill to appear in court. U.S. Radium tried to delay the case further, stating that many of their witnesses were out of the country on holiday. The public saw this as a heartless avoidance of justice, National outrage prompted the courts to move ahead with the case. However, days before the case was set to continue, U.S. Radium and Fryer's lawyer decided to settle out of court. The women accepted this reluctantly, too desperate to refuse. Afterwards, U.S. Radium stated that settling out of court did not indicate that the company acknowledged the truth of the women's complaints or, and I quote, that we admit responsibility or liability. Each woman received $10,000, the equivalent of $100,000 today, and all their medical and legal expenses paid. They were also guaranteed $600 a year until death. Sadly, few of these annuity payments were collected by the women, as they died soon after the case was settled. The last of the Radium Girls died in the 1930s. U.S. Radium closed in 1926. There was another radium factory in Ottawa, Illinois, run by the Radium Dial Corporation, which began operating in 1922. This factory employed around 1,000 women and did its best to keep the news about U.S. radium from their workers. 
At the time, information did not spread as quickly as it does now, and many people in other U.S. states hadn't heard about the Radium Girls. In 1926, the women at the Ottawa factory began having health issues as well. The company did health evaluations of its workers, but never released that information to them. When the dial painters finally did hear the news of the Radium Girls, their employers told them that the radium they were working with was a different, safer kind. The workers, now wary of their employers, began asking for compensation for their illnesses in 1927, and Radium Dial paid. The demand for compensation grew in the early 1930s, and the Dial Painters eventually mounted a court case in 1937. By this point, Radium Dial had closed, but the courts did not throw out the case. In 1938, the Illinois Industrial Commission ruled in favor of the Dial Painters. Medical research soon revealed the extent of the harm caused by radium. By shaping their brushes with their lips, the dial painters of U.S. Radium and the Radium Dial Company had ingested between 100 and 1,000 microcuries of radium. The amount now considered the maximum amount that can be ingested and remain safe is one-eighth of a microcurie. Physicians everywhere stopped using radium as a treatment and most of the patent medicines were discontinued. Even though the dial painters of U.S. Radium did not win their court case, their story had an effect on the future of occupational health and the rights of workers. U.S. Radium wasn't the only radium company, but it had acted in a very despicable way, and laws were put in place to prevent that type of behavior in the future. In 1949, the U.S. Congress passed a bill making it the legal right of an employee to seek compensation for all occupational diseases and extended the length of time they had to claim that compensation from the company. A research facility for the long-term health effects of radium was set up in 1968 by Dr. Robley D. Evans, who had been working with the ill dial painters since 1933. The Center for Human Radiobiology at the Argonne National Laboratory in Chicago followed the health of over 2,000 dial painters and other people who worked with radium and other radioactive materials closely, monitoring their health over the course of their lives and the levels of radium still within their bodies. Most of the people the laboratory monitored were women, as dial painters were almost all women at the time. The lab made several discoveries. One of these was that 80% of the radium ingested by the dial workers was not absorbed by their bones, showing that the 20% that was absorbed was exceptionally detrimental. A great majority of individuals who were not exposed for a long period of time had little to no ill health effects. Also, those that were exposed long term had a 30 to 50% chance of developing osteosarcoma or bone cancer between 5 and 50 years after they were exposed. The laboratory also set the standards for safe levels of radiation, both in short- and long-term exposure situations. Sadly, the Center for Human Radiobiology was shut down in 1993 by the U.S. Department of Energy, even though it still had 1,000 subjects in the program. The Argonne National Laboratory, however, still exists, and although all nuclear research was shut down, the laboratory continues to research ways to use X-rays more safely and with better imaging results. Unfortunately, occupational health and safety laws today are still not perfect. Companies and governments often find ways around these laws in order to bring in more profit at the expense of their employees' health. In fact, there are still some instances in which substances known to cause harm are still being used and are currently having their uses expanded, despite a large body of evidence that clearly shows a detrimental effect on human health. It's amazing how money can bring out the monster in some humans. There are several books and articles about this topic I'd like to recommend if you want to know more. The first is a book by Kate Moore, called The Radium Girls. This book was also recommended by Emma Watson as part of her book club, and I agree it's worth reading. It's really engaging and also full of information. The second recommendation I have is actually a report produced by the Argonne National Laboratory by R.E. Rowland 
called Radium in Humans, a review of U.S. studies. This one is a bit heavy on chemistry, but contains everything you might want to know about radium's history in the United States. It's also a free PDF that you can find by googling it. It's incredibly detailed and an excellent resource. The women who were killed by radium gave their lives to find justice for future generations. There is always a risk in experimenting with newly discovered substances, as well as trying existing substances for new purposes. The best way to reduce that risk is to research, research, research. That goes for products today as well. You might learn something, and you'll definitely satisfy your curiosity. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show at Morbid Podcast or find us on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, please share us on social media and give us a rating on iTunes. Thank you to everyone who commented, suggested topics, shared MCP posts, and liked or followed the MCP on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. People like Donald, Lawrence, Veronica, Donnell, Leia, Neville, Marsha, Pete, Jean, and Ancient History Fangirl. Alex, Angela, Sam, Rachel, Patricia, Susan, and Paige all have my eternal gratitude for becoming patrons on Patreon. Thank you so much for your support. Because of you, the listeners, our creepy community is growing, especially on Facebook, so head over there to engage with other listeners, discuss episodes and news articles, share your creepy stories and cute pet pictures. The MCP is part of a wider creepy community known as the Belfry Podcast Network. Check out the other shows on the Belfry Network at www.thebelfry.rip. As I said before, if you really like the MCP, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. You can also give a one-time donation by going to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com, and clicking the donate button. On our website, you'll also find links to all our social media, links to our sponsors, and other ways to contact us. We are eternally grateful for your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thanks for listening.